In this module, we're going to look at the fire environment in Alaska. The 2004 fire season was the worst fire season they've had on record, and the numbers generated tell the story. The 6.6 .6 million acres they burnt beat the previous record set in 1957 by over a million and a half acres. This was their most costly fire season in terms of suppression costs, and they hosted the largest number of lower 48 hotshot crews and incident management teams than ever before. For the first time, engines from the lower 48 were shipped up there and used on wildfires. It was the warmest summer they've had on record, and Fairbanks was smoked in for 42 days versus the old record of 19. They found themselves hosting a large number of visiting firefighters, and a lot of preconceived notions and myths were destroyed this year as many people for the first time learned what it was really like to fight fire in Alaska. Things are different up there, just as they're different in various parts of the lower 48, and it's our responsibility to prepare ourselves the best we can whenever we take an out-of-region assignment. So to get some first-hand knowledge of what it's like to fight fire in Alaska, let's talk to some firefighters who've made a career out of it. So I'd have to say that the, you know, in Alaska, the truth is that the lower 48 uh, fuel models don't actually represent uh, how the blacks produce and the fuel models burn in Alaska. And we have a tendency to, to use the CFFDRS, which is a Canadian Forest Fire Danger Rating System. We've, we have two fuel types for black spruce. One is called C2 and C1. And C2 is a closed black spruce, thicker lowland. C, C1 is an upland black spruce, which would be similar to this, with sparse fuels and vegetation. But those sparse fuels and vegetation have a lot of calamagrostis in them, and there's a lot of dead and down underneath them. They grow in a clump. They're called button grasses. So they grow from the center out and drop. So the head is really nice and green, but actually dry. Uh, the height on those will go anywhere from you know, ankle height to uh, hip high on them. And so you're talking about a bale of hay standing up when it's hip high, just stacked next to each other. So the only thing the Canadian model doesn't do a real good job of is spotting. But black spruce doesn't typically spot that far um, because it doesn't have the elevation, the heat all rises in it. But what we do like about black spruce is plume dominated fires because actually when we get plume dominated fires we can actually manipulate them. And when they lay it, when they're laid down or at an angle or anything like that, it's hard to do it. That means large-scale burning, you know, and, and taking the risk to burn it, which we um, use aerial firing PSD machine as one of our primary initial attack tools. Besides the jumpers, and hot shots, and hell attack, and engines, and everything, that's always a tool we have that we use it for. And large scale by large scale, um, you know, this year. Um, we run a fuel cycle where we turn on the machine and, you know, 26 miles, you know, and that this year we've gone, I've personally gone through 203 boxes of PSD balls, you know, doing backfires and firing and forward firings as we like to call them on the work and so. The typical, a typical deployment for a crew uh, from the lower 48 into Alaska uh, would be, uh, uh, they'd, they'd land in a port city and they usually they'd get a uh, Alaska briefing, uh, which is unfortunate but it's uh, it doesn't happen until they arrive and like uh, it'd be nice if that happened prior to departure from their home unit but they get a uh, Alaska briefing and that will uh, uh, try and get them somewhat acclimated to what's going to happen and then a lot of times um, that will be their last um, contact with any real civil civilization uh, they could end up in any any one of numerous remote areas where there's no store, uh, no facilities. The contact between most crews and most fires down south is a daily contact, if not multiple times in a day, talking to the crews and actually physically seeing them and talking to them. In Alaska, we have so much distance and, and stuff like that that I might not see one of these crews for four or five days, but I and we might talk to them on the radio multiple times a day, but we don't have contact. And, and contact is one of the big things that people have a hard time with. If they're not looking in your eyes when they're talking to you, they don't understand that you're not getting it. But there's some places where, you know, we're stretched out on this highway right now for about 112 miles one way, and going north, we're stretched out for another 80. So the area is, is very large, and me actually physically seeing everybody every day is not going to happen. Even if we had several, multiple branches on this, it wouldn't happen. But uh, contact is a big one. The other one I would say is, is um, be prepared to live like you were camping, you know, and, and the toughest part of that is is that, you know, you have wildlife out here that's an issue, you have helicopter time that's an issue, and you have the probability that you might get fogged in or smoked in for a couple of days and not get seen. So, you know, prepare your camps for, you know, we say at least have three days of food and water on the ground at all times. 
you know, to, to maintain that. The other one is is that you have to live in the camp with 20 other people and get along with them because you're not going to get away from them. There's no opportunity to walk into fire camp and talk to other people. There's no opportunity to go down and use a telephone or take a shower. You're stuck in a setting like this, um, and it may have a lake and it may not, or a stream or water, that you're going to end up fighting fire with guys for 20, 21 days, you know, or two 14-period days now. We eat a lot of rats, a lot of MREs. And um, usually every four, three or four days, we get a fresh food box orders. It's got a bunch of canned uh, food and pasta and rice and steaks and hot dogs. You know, so I mean, it's just like you're camping up up here. It's, that's what's really unique about fighting up in Alaska. It's not the uh, catered catered food that you'll get down south. No bag lunches. It's usually rats and uh, the fresh food boxes that you get resupplied four days or so. The issue with the fresh food boxes is hygiene. Because there's no washing facilities out here, you guys have to build your own washing facilities out of cube containers and use them in a stream and soap and water because everybody's got to use that food. So, And your knives and forks and stuff like that, you know, everybody has to dip out of the same peanut butter jar. So that's a huge issue is hygiene and locating your, you know, your outhouse further away from your camp than you normally would because it's going to be a cooking kitchen area also. So. Those are a couple of considerations for that when you do your layout in your camp and where you're going to have your bathroom facilities and your eating facilities uh, and the tarp. Bring a good tent. If you have to put visqueen over your tent, it's not a tent. So uh, make the effort and purchase a good tent. Um, that's a huge issue with us right now. We're still getting people coming to Alaska without tents, period. And then we still get people coming with those pop-up tents. And, you know, that's not a tent for Alaska standards. Uh, your tent is your is your survival. If it gets fogged in or raining, you know, that's your survival shelter. So spend the money on it. You know, uh, we always use that theory, you know, a $10 helmet for a $10 head. So um, if you think you're only worth 100 bucks, you know, buy a $100 tent, that's not any good. But spend a little more if you want to count on the survival. So Rain doesn't put out fire in Alaska. Like you said, that, that moss layer is really deep. So you get heat, heat gets under there, you get a ton of rain that heat is still protected, you know, it's not getting to that heat and after a couple of days it dries out and it'll start to build up again and just when you think it's over, it's not. Rain gear is a huge issue, people not bringing rain gear, proper rain gear, I mean, um, we get rain on these fires for four or five days and people think we're demoping them and uh, we don't, we stay on them and four or five days from then it'll be up and running again so you're going to be working in rain and uh, the, walking through this kind of conditions you're going to get wet so um, be prepared for an extended stay in the wilderness while you're working. Bugs, there's a bunch. There's definitely a, it's, it's known that mosquitoes, you also have white socks, uh, horse flies, and uh, they're relentless. They're, they're everywhere. I mean, you can't, you can't get away from them. Uh, we dealt with some up in Venati as far as horse flies, and they would just bite you nonstop, bite right through your Nomex everything you have. Um, mosquitoes weren't as bad this year, I think just because of the part of uh, being so dry as well, but then I think that's where the White Sox stepped up and and they're, and they're just as bad, if not worse. They, I mean, they bite and you'll swell right up. I've jumped in many streams and lakes around here to wash off and, you know, you jump in with your clothes on, soap those up, take them off and soap yourself up and dry them off. So. You know, I typically, I'm old school, I, uh, you know, two pair of fire clothes and they've been in my pack this year, all year, and I think I've washed them twice and that's just because I haven't had a chance to get through them. Uh, rain and walking in the river and uh, hosing them down when I can, but yeah, you're cycling through a lot of a lot of stuff. If you're planning on changing clothes every day, you're going to max out your weight in socks, but you know, you can wash stuff out. In camp. Um, you know, feet's a big one too, good boots. I couldn't tell you preference on good boots. Uh, I buy a certain brand because they've always done me good, but uh, taking care of your feet is certainly one of the better issues. Uh, we have a lot of water and you're fighting fire and standing water a lot of the time, so you know, real proper care of it. Uh, good socks and good foot powder and taking care of your feet. It's a long way to medical attention sometimes and you have to rely on the people with you. And you know, being 30 days in some boots that are not any good doesn't do anybody good. You make your living on your feet and if you're not on them, you're not making your living, so spend the money on good boots. Uh, we wear bean boots, which are a rubber bottom and a leather upper top, which has been approved for Alaska for even flying and working in. Um, I wear those, but 
you know, I typically step in water over my boots, so it doesn't really matter. I like some that drains well, so I wear leather boots all year round. Same boots I wear down south, I wear up here. The the Alaskan teams typically are are small. You know, usually we have 11 core individuals, and then we build with whatever we can get, either pulled from within the resources on scene there, or uh, maybe ordering from uh, other locations. And uh, teams uh, oftentimes come up here. They may bring. Uh, you know, anywhere from 30 to 60 individuals. And uh, you have to make a choice right away who you're going to send into the incident. So you have to divide up uh, what you think are essentials. And that's usually uh, uh, your logistical folks to get things rolling that way, along with operations folks to make sure you don't lose out in transition as far as your suppression tactics go out there. And, uh, you know, the, the team size, uh, the 30, 60, plus individual, they become very unwieldy here uh, as far as air operations go and logistically moving them and then all the support mechanisms that, that go along with them. And then teams, again, they are used to motels and uh, a lot of things that are available in the lower 48 and, and here and uh, you may end up in uh, just some uh, wide open location next to a river or something like that and uh, and so you have to, your, your camp building uh, becomes an essential skill out there. Uh, you know, a lot of it goes back to kind of old school stuff. You may have to hand draw a map initially, and getting good maps out to the field has become an issue. Uh, a lot of times nowadays we, we, we are so self-reliant on GIS that that's what people are tied into, and uh, operations folks in the field may have to wait two, three days for a really good map, and uh, that's really unacceptable. So. Uh, going back to the topo map, uh, hand drawing a, a map out there and getting that out in the field uh, may be your best technology to, to start with. And interagency cooperation here is huge. Um, you know, a, a lot of times uh, we don't care what organization uh, you're associated with. We're, we're looking for a yellow shirt, really. Uh, and it may come in the form of uh, smoke jumpers, type 1 crews, type 2 crews. Fire departments are uh, big here. Uh, we have uh, volunteer fire departments, paid volunteer combinations, and just paid alone. And uh, getting those people to uh, to get into your organization too is uh, essential. And you you have to maybe teach them what uh, you want as uh, as uh, far as what uh, your expectations are out there, and they in turn may be able to teach you. Uh, uh, some local knowledge as, as far as uh, what you can utilize from uh, uh, around the area there. You may be stuck in a, a small village, a small town, something like that, and um, again, incorporating the local knowledge there. Those people know what's out there, uh, what equipment you may be able to, to use. They may be able to get you transportation. Uh, they may be able to let you use a local school. They can, they can uh, certainly bring a lot to your organization. It's essential that you uh, incorporate as much of that as you can out there. And now to give you the perspective from a lower 48 firefighter on assignment in Alaska, let's go to the Gardner Fire, which was part of the Taylor Complex. Chuck Russell is a firefighter from Wyoming that was assigned as a task force leader. My name's Chuck Russell, and uh, I was assigned to the Gardner Creek Fire as a task force leader on uh, Division Gulf. After we saw which direction the fire was going, I called the division supervisor and let him know that it was going to bump the Alaskan Canadian Highway at some point. And uh, this is Alaska Canadian Highway right here, and it, uh, the Canadian border is about 20 miles that direction. And then Northway uh, is back to the west of us, oh, about 12 to 15 miles from here. The main objectives for this assignment was to keep the fire north of the Alcan Highway. We didn't want fire on the other side of the road. There's too much line to go direct. We just, we didn't have enough and, and, and the idea was to try and stay one step ahead of the fire and kind of herd it in the right direction by, by doing an indirect attack, uh, burning out um, on the, the road. And, and that's the problem out here is uh, Alaska, there's really not very many natural barriers. Uh, and uh, the Alaska Canadian Highway was the best thing that we had. We just made some strips right along the Alaska Canadian Highway, started around this bend, uh, the back side of the hardwoods, uh, through the black spruce, and there's a mixture of white spruce in there. Uh, we dropped it down the back side of this, and then we ended up cleaning up the hardwoods later on the lee side of the slope. We dropped down into the tussocks, and once we got in here, uh, this black spruce tussock mix, it really started to burn a lot better. 
and our burn was being more effective. And this is where the main portion of the fire was going to hit, was in this bottom. Uh, so we just continued to progress. We dropped down to one burner because it was awful hard to walk in this tusk tussocks. I don't know if you've ever walked in them before, but uh, when I first came up here in a briefing, they said it's like walking on a greased bowling ball on a waterbed. And that's a fairly well, fairly good analogy in my opinion. Uh, we continued to burn just off the highway and uh, we tied it back into the highway before we got into the heavier fuels. And uh, our burnout uh, met well with the flaming front and we just had a few spots that we had to pick up and the fire was pretty much tied in. I think one of the, the main things different from the lower 48 fighting fire, and of course there's a lot of different array of fuel types in the lower 48 that are vastly different uh, amongst themselves, but the main thing that I've noticed up here is you end up having to do a lot more with a lot less. Uh, you give a, you're given a division that's uh, 27 miles long or 20 miles long, or you got a 200,000 acre fire and, and that's your chunk of country. Uh, that's unheard of in the lower 48. Uh, as far as crews coming up here, um, there's a, lot, a big difference as far as our direct attack goes. Uh, there is no such thing as in most places up here as a, putting a scrape down or putting a line down. Uh, you're beating it out with spruce boughs and, and, and cutting saw line and, and bringing pumps and hose in later if you have water sources. Um, don't plan on getting anywhere fast. Uh, to look at a map and to go cross country, I can I travel a mile back home even in, in pretty rugged terrain in a pretty big hurry. This is flat right through here where we're standing and uh, these tussocks just make travel uh, very difficult, very slow and uh, you need to take that into consideration. You can look across the train and say, well that's flat, I can bug through that. And that's not the case. Um, there are no good natural barriers that I've seen. I mean, you'll get a lake and you'll get a slough in certain areas and that's about all you have. Uh, you've got just seas of, of uh, black spruce and uh, and tussocks and everywhere you look there's fuel on the ground so that's a I've, I've always had a problem uh, coming up here and, and trying to find a good safety zone and a good escape route and, and uh, a lot of times what you got to do is just find a good piece of a black to tie into and, and that's your best bet. The other thing is it was hard for me to look at the big picture once I came up here right at first I'd walk a dozer line and it ends I'd walk a hand line and it just ends. Uh, nothing was tied in that I could see. And uh, you start looking at the big picture and, and a lot of what we were doing and what previous teams before I got here were trying to accomplish was steering this in the direction that they wanted it to head. Uh, they knew they couldn't get around the whole thing so they, they punched in a dozer line and it ended. And uh, that was the area they were gonna burn off of and, and let it do its thing once it blew on past. And, I'm not really used to that. I'm used to tying everything in and, and it's all tidy and neat when we're done. You always got to keep control of yourself and, and uh, that's the most important thing is, is all of us are given assignments by overhead and uh, we need to look at what we're supposed to accomplish, what the goals and objectives are and weigh those with the risks and, and uh, whether we can accomplish them or not in the time given us. And once we say, yeah, we're going to go for it and, and uh, we can do this, then we need to start being accountable for ourselves. And it uh, doesn't matter if you're firefighter type 2 or if you're the division suit, uh, safety starts with ourselves first. And uh, the training we need to pay attention to. And we need to have that situational awareness. We need to know what's going on at all times. I know a lot, a lot of times when I first started out in my career, you get your head in the desert, dirt and you know that you're supposed to dig line, but you've, you've never looked up for the last half hour, 45 minutes, as to what's going on around you. You're counting on somebody else. But we always need to be aware of what's going on around us and, uh, and take it all in if we can. And uh, That's the best thing that I can say is, is that uh, this area that the snags come down, as soon as it burns through, 15 minutes later, I can stand in one, one spot one spot in a black spruce or, or a white spruce patch and uh, hear 15, 20 snakes come down. Uh, the root, root system is not very deep at all and uh, if you don't have your head up 
and uh, your wits about you, you can get conked on the head. Despite the record number of people we had in Alaska this year and the extreme fire behavior they experienced, fire line safety remained the number one priority. Commendably, they only suffered a few minor injuries and zero fatalities throughout the season, which is typical of Alaska's exceptional safety record. In the recent past, many Alaskan firefighters have had the opportunity to take out-of-region assignments down south, but this year provided opportunities for a number of first-timers to Alaska. It's our hope that whenever you take a fire assignment to an area that you haven't been before, that you prepare yourself the best you can before you arrive. The internet has proven to be a very valuable tool in this regard. But for now, let's get into our groups and discuss in more detail what a person should do to get ready for an assignment outside their local unit.